cartels and the political leaders have been addressing on the concerned subject. And today, uh, we have a pleasure to invite Dr. Rampuniani, uh, who has been uh, many for many decades. He was in the Valiant struggle for the democracy and uh, against uh, fascist uh, oppression and for the people's culture and uh, uh, human rights. Uh, on the in total, the, the highest value of, for the democratic society. So, uh, Dr. Rampuniani uh, will be addressing on the challenge of uh, in, uh, for the Indian democracy uh, in the context of the uh, neo fascist uh, rule, uh, which is uh, India is uh, under the, undergoing now. So, Dr. Uh, Rampuniani ji, uh, you, we are uh, on behalf of the reception committee of the Party Congress of CPML Rashtra, uh, we warmly invite you for this uh, lecture and we thank you for your valuable time. Uh, even uh, uh, with your uh, other busy schedules and the health issues. So uh, please uh, uh, start on your lecture, uh, Dr. Kapunian. Uh, thank you very much, Kabir, and uh, I'm happy and glad to be with uh, you people. And uh, we'll be discussing about uh, challenges to Indian democracy uh, and how do we overcome it. Uh, before I begin, uh, Kabir, will you tell me, number one, uh, which language is better, Hindi or English? Uh, 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 this is up to you, both uh, Hindi and English are okay. Uh, this is up to which, whichever convenient. So you can be, be both, or you can either in English or in Hindi. That is uh, for your convenience, whatever uh, language it is. Convenient in both. I'll go by the audience. Audience is more comfortable with which language? Yes, uh, that will be English. More comfortable because it's a national level, uh, mainly from the South Indian. Whatever. Uh, my main concern is. Uh, reception by the audience, if they are more comfortable in English, uh, perfect. I'll carry on in English. And uh, so, and how long you think I should present and then we can have question answer? Yes, uh, this uh, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, you can uh, have a lecture, then we will have a brief uh, question answers. So good evening, friends. And uh, again, I thank you for uh, inviting me to talk on this uh, very challenging topic. Uh, as we all know, Indian democracy today has is facing severe, uh, severe uh, challenges. And these challenges come, number one, in the form of uh, the basic concept of undoing, undoing equality. Uh, the preamble of our constitution begins with uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. Now, all these three values have come under attack if we see people expressing their opinion, they are criticized, they are called anti-nationals, they are imprisoned. Many of our uh, eminent writers and activists, they are in jail because of uh, speaking truth or speaking for peace and harmony uh, because this does not suit the real ruling dispensation. So number one, the very concept of equal uh, liberty is at stake. Number two, equality, when we say that uh, the state will regard all the people irrespective of their language, religion, caste, and gender as equal citizens. As the matters are developing, we are seeing that there is a domination of uh, domination in the name of people of one religion. And even within that religion, all the people are not having the same status because of caste and varna system prevalent in that uh, religion. The third thing which we say about fraternity, the fraternity, though, of course, it is a male-oriented world, uh, we should modify it into community. So national community, when we mean, by that we mean that we live with uh, harmony, peace, and amity with people of all the religions. Today, what we see, there is a growing hatred there is a, uh, adverse thinking, adverse social common sense against the religious minorities, particularly the Muslims and Christians. And at this, in the same way, 
uh, by through a mechanism of uh, social manipulation, the Dalits are also being relegated to the margins of society. Adivasis, though we have a woman Adivasi president, as such, the basic rights of Adivasis for decent living and their rights on Jal, Jungle, Jameen, they are also under jeopardy. So this is one, the outcome which we see. Second, we see that in democracy, we have four pillars that uh, executive, judiciary, legislative, legislative, and the media. These are the four pillars of democracy. And if we see gradually that judiciary, which is supposed to be the main protector of our constitution, it shows a lot of tilt in its judgments and it tries to toe the line of the ruling government. And that way, one of the major checks on the ruling government is uh, becoming weak, even ineffective, as we have seen in so many uh, matters. The matters of crucial interest, for example, one example I'll give the abolition of Article 370, the executive did it, but it is challenged under a challenge because Article 370 cannot be abrogated without the consent of Constituent Assembly of Kashmir. Of course, there is no Constituent Assembly in Kashmir, but even the legislator of Kashmir was not consulted, had given no opinion on this abrogation of Article 370. So judiciary is sitting quiet on these issues of great importance uh, of constitution of the very basic concept of India as a nation. Uh, so even the other agencies which are supposed to be autonomous, independent, like CBI, Enforcement Directorate, Election Commission, and other such bodies, they are also showing a lot of tilt towards the ruling government. And media, if you know, media is a very tragic story. Indian media, right, starting from Bal Gangadhar Tilak to many of our leaders, they, they started their own newspapers to articulate the aspirations of the people of India. But uh, from 2003 and 2004, we see gradually most of the media has been taken over by the corporates, which is sympathetic to the ruling government. And in that way, a very appropriate word, Godi media has come up. Godi means, Godi media means a media which is sitting in the lap of the government. Now the basic why media is given so much importance is democracy is because as a fourth estate, it is supposed to be, it is duty bound to ask questions to power, to ask the questions about uh, uncomfortable questions to the ruling party, ruling uh, government, so that the policies can be brought on the track for the betterment of people at large. So this is one. And secondly, we see that the very concept of democracy is based on the our citizenship, which is irrespective of our religion, caste, gender, or whether we are Adivasis or city dwellers or uh, non-Adivasis. But today we see that people belonging to one religion and that too, the elite section of Hindu, Hindus are given primacy in policy making. Then if you Uh, your voice mic is muted. Sorry, the, it went on mute. So I was talking that uh, a, as far as our uh, other aspects of democracy are concerned, it uh, the basis of citizenship is uh, basis of uh, our citizenship here is not religion, not religion. It is by virtue of we staying on this land that we are citizens. But lately, the concepts are coming, which try to relate citizenship with a particular single religion. So basically, all these things, uh, if we see 
there is a big deal of infiltration infiltration of communal people when i i hope you get my point by communal people because in india i will try to slightly outline that muslim communalism also developed hindu communalism also developed both communalisms are opposed to the very concept of democracy with the partition of the country muslim communalism got deflated majority of its leaders and followers they left for pakistan but it is not to say that in in india there is no muslim communalism it is there in a smaller form it acts to give provocation to the majoritarian majoritarian communalism so it is also there but the real threat to democracy comes in the form of majoritarian communalism and when i say communalism communalism is a politics which uses religion's identity for political mobilization i'll repeat this communalism is a politics which opposed to the democratic politics it uses identity of religion to mobilize people to gain political power now when we talk of these identity issues that relates to issues related to for example what you have seen ram temple lav jihad cow beef ghar wapsi in the major and again it tries to uh, give provocative things as far as the religious minorities are concerned so today uh, when i am talking about threats to indian democracy i say that the major threat to indian democracy is from this politics in the name of religion which we call communalism now there is a difference between religion as moral value religion as faith and religion as identity now mostly uh, it is not only in india that communalism is developing its other parallel similar word is fundamentalism we are again the basic tenets of religion interpreted interpreted by some are imposed upon the society in communalism also the communitarian identity particularly as i outlined in those four issues is uh, put forward to to and it derails the democratic process away from the real issues of the people real issues related to their rights right to work right to food right to life right to religion uh, issues related to food shelter employment dignity and all those things which are supposed to be the basic things they are pushed aside and what comes to the center is this issues which have not much concern except that of constructed faith most of the faith is not inherent inbuilt or ancient some of this faith is also constructed one i can very well say ram temple ayodhya like uh, i i have been observing this 50 years ago this was not a part of the faith that there was a ram temple which has been destroyed so we have to destroy the mosque to build a mosque so this is a constructed constructed faith now one of course religion is very much closely interlinked to faith now most of this uh, politics which comes in now i'll focus only to indian scenario uh, here the communal politics which come come has come up is polar opposite to the values of democracy politics in the name of religion mainly harps on the values which are pre industrial society pre modern of course i am not using the modern word very accurately but it is the time of feudalism type of land time of landlordism the values which were there communal politics brings up those values and so i will delve a bit into in india how communal politics came into being and how it is affecting people's lives to begin with of course earlier there were hindu kings 
Muslim kings. Today, they are highly, the religion of the king is very much highlighted and particularly Muslim kings' actions are related to today's Muslims in demonizing them, in created, creating hatred against them, hatred which is a foundation of violence. So this earlier, of course, kings were there. They were not ruling for religion. They did destroy temples and holy places, but not for religion. Mostly their temples and sometimes the mosques were destroyed by Muslim kings as well as Hindu kings in order to gain wealth, in order to gain wealth, which was lying in the temples. Religions also did not spread by force, like Islam in India did not spread by uh, kings as it is popularly understood. Actually, Islam in India came because of two major factors. One is Arab traders coming to Malabar coast, intermingling, mixing with the local people, and that is the beginning of Islam. Similarly, Swami Vivekananda points out very well that it is wrong to say that Islam spread on the strength of the sword. The untouchables, the Shudras, the Dalits, they embraced Islam to escape the tyranny of caste varna system. Please underline this sentence of Swami Vivekananda because this has been used very much in spreading hatred against today's Muslim community. So uh, I also see that no religion generally can be spread by force. Similar is the case with Christianity, where Christianity in India spread through the missionary work in the far off remote areas where the government and the social facilities was not reaching. So kings, today they are highlighted very much, but kings were not ruling for religion. They were ruling for power, they were ruling for wealth, and they were ruling for expanding their kingdoms. So if there is a Chola king in the south, he will try to exp uh, expand to Sri Lanka, attack Sri Lanka, and bring the slaves from there to work as slave labor here. If there is a uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj for Maharashtra, he will go to the, his army will go up to Bengal to plunder it. He will also try to expand his uh, area of influence, but this has nothing to do with religion as such. Now, religion coming to the political space begins with the coming of British, coming of British. And of course, you know that it is a coming of British, which is a beginning of slavery of India. When do we call any particular nation as a slave? First thing, it is very clear that earlier, earlier, there were many scattered kingdoms. It was not that Hindu rule or a Muslim rule. Muslim kings had Hindu advisors. Hindu kings had Muslim associates. So it was not Hindu rule or a Muslim rule. This whole concept of king being at the center of the history was introduced by British to pursue their policy of divide and rule. Particularly after 1857, even before 1857, in 1818 itself, a James Mills book, History of India came, which periodized, which periodized the history according to ancient Hindu period, medieval Muslim period, and modern British period. See their cleverness in trying to hide their religion and they're trying to attempt to uh, overproject the religion of kings of those times. If you go into the details of history, we will see that even amongst Hindus, there were different, different type of uh, dynasties. It was not that there was a single Hindu dynasty or a single Muslim dynasty. So that, of course, British did it because in 1857, 1857, there was a great revolt, rebellion. It was not just rebellion, it was close to a revolution, peasant revolution, in which the uh, princely princess of the states also participated. It was not based on religion. The first war of independence, as uh, somebody has pointed out, uh, it was not based on religion. There are people like Mangal Pandey, there are people Bahadur Shah Zafar, 
Tatya Sab Tope, Nana Sab Peshwa, Jhansi Kirani, all this they came together for their own goals. Particularly at the center of it was a peasant uprising. Peasants were being exploited severely and their uprising disturbed the British rule. Now with this, British intensified their policy of divide and rule, and they harped on uh, Muslim kings being uh, temple destroyers, spreaders of religion through force, Hindu kings being cowards, not being able to stand up. So these on one side. On the second side, as British come, why I call it is a period of slavery, because it is with British that they ruled here, they plundered our wealth, and we were being ruled from London. That's why it is a period of slavery. Muslim kings period cannot be called as slavery. Why? Because they lived here, died here, exploited here, and died here. So this was not a period of slavery. And I will say, uh, from uh, because of the changes which were brought in by British in the form of transport, railways, in the form of communication, telephone, telegraph, postal system, in the form of education, modern judiciary, and the jail system, reform in jail system. These three major changes led to the rise of three new classes. Now, these three new classes which come up, businessmen, industrialists at that time, the working class emerged, and modern educated people emerged. It is from this group that which I call as rising classes. It is from this group that Indian nationalism, democratic, secular, plural, diverse concepts come up from this section. Now, as society is changing, the old ruling classes, the landlords, the Hindu kings, the Muslim kings, they feel disturbed. And as they feel disturbed, they also form some organizations. To make the job simpler, first let's be very clear that in the rising classes, the inherent values are that of democracy. The inherent values are that of pluralism, diversity, and as Surendra Nath Banerjee brilliantly put it, he put this in his book, uh, India nation in the making. India nation in the making. Nationalism is a long debate by itself. So it is this foundation coming from the new classes that the values of democracy emerge. Now, so just see, I'll give one example of uh, rising classes throwing up their organizations and the old ruling classes, which are now becoming weaker, they also throw up their organizations. The rising, of course, there are many organizations. I can't uh, outline in a brief way. Uh, I will send uh, a series of videos, full-fledged videos, and some basic material through one email to uh, Kabir and Tuhin. You can uh, share it and uh, try to expand the theme which we are putting forward today. So uh, it is from the so three representative names. I'll give first from the rising classes. And now this rising classes concept, declining rulers concept is central to my understanding of communalism, which is a threat to Indian democracy today. So rising classes, the representative organizations, just three I am naming. One is that of uh, Shahid Azam Bhagat Singh in the form of Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. Second, in the form of Bhimra Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Republican Party of India. And third group, which represents the fraternity, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Annie Besant, Sardar Baldev Singh, and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi in the form of Indian National Congress. Please note at these three names, three names. Hindustan Socialist Republican Association, Republican Party of India, Bharatiya Rashtriya Congress or Indian National Congress. Now the declining classes, the old ruling classes, the old feudal classes, the old prince, prince, rajas, nawabs, they came together, they came together. Initially in their organizations, it was only they 
who were participating later on some elite educated people also joined them and uh, their uh, they, they gave uh, ideological foundation to the politics of the old feudal classes so what are these i'll just name here three groups three groups here you just will note that in their organization there is a prefix of religion or there is a goal revolving around religion which basically is nothing to do with morality of religion not to do with mor morality of religion but trying to bring back the old values so here three examples again i'll give mohammad ali jinnah muslim league vinayak damodar savarkar hindu mahasabha and rss for hindu rashtra so i hope you can make out here uh Re hindustan socialist republican association republican party of india bharatiya rashtra congress religion is not the determining factor and in declining sections we see muslim league hindu mahasabha and rss for hindu nation so the rising classes they contributed to the making of modern india just to give a contrast how these two values are different on one side i'll put uh, ambedkar on the other side i'll put a representative from rss k sudarshan uh, k sudarshan was sara sangh chalak the supreme dictator of rss in the year 2000 so ambedkar if you see whole his life he struggled for social equality access right to access to public drinking water right to temple entry all this he did and he had to face lot of problems it was opposed the communal organizations rss etc never supported them uh, and all that so same ambedkar went on to burn a book called manusmriti manusmriti why he must have burnt it he knew that manusmriti gives the provisions of slavery for shudras and women same ambedkar went on to be the chief architect of india's constitution so i hope you know here there is a indian nationalism rising trying to do away with the values of caste and gender hierarchy and trying to bring in the values of liberty equality fraternity initially these values come as formality and then there is a journey there is a pressure of social movements through this which this formal values should become substantive over a period of time okay so this is here and the old people here k sudarshan's example i was giving he openly bluntly said that indian constitution is based on the western values it should be thrown away and replaced by a constitution based on indian holy book i hope you can make out that what he is hinting at is towards the manusmriti i am tempted to tell you recently there was this tiranga festival and all that uh tiranga which was a symbol of indian nationalism of course it is not tiranga it has four colors because there is a blue central wheel also uh so that uh, uh rss refused to uh uh hoist it for 52 long years saying that the real flag of hindu rashtra is a saffron flag when indian constitution came into being they criticized it saying that it is all based on values which to which indian people are not used to and the values which indian people should have like those of traditional conservative manusmriti values are missing from this Uh, a document called indian constitution anyway so the rising classes contributed to the formation of modern india many of most of them participated in the freedom movement while the declining sections mus hindu mahasabha muslim league rss they kept aloof from the freedom movement of course india got freedom because of the contributions of national movement because of the contributions of indian national army of subhash chandra bose 
because of the contribution of uh, Bhagat Singh and other revolutionaries. That these are multiple factors of which the central factor, central factor, of course, was the non this uh, anti-colonial movement led by Mahatma Gandhi. Now, so here uh, I, in a bit, I will try to understand uh, because today RSS is the main force which is trying to nibble away our democracy bit by bit, piece by piece. So we need to understand what is its basic understanding. So here I will introduce four words, Hindu, Hinduism, Hindutva, and Hindu Rashtra. Now, Savarkar, though he was not in RSS, but RSS was inspired by Savarkar's book, Hindutva or who is a Hindu. In that, of course, first I must say the word Hindu is nowhere in the Hindu holy scriptures. Word Hindu was coined by the people coming from the West, from Central Asia, from Arabia, Iran, Iraq, towards this side. And this word Hindu was a derivative from river Sindhu, Indus. Initially, it was used for land. Later on, various Hindu traditions, Brahminism, Shramanism. Brahminism based on caste and gender hierarchy. Shramanism based on uh, equality of caste and gender in its most elementary form. Because there is no prophet in Hinduism, so different tendencies were scattered. So all of them were put together and labeled as Hinduism. So first land, Hindu, Hinduism religion. Then Savarkar comes in to say that uh, the concept of Pitrabhumi, Punyabhumi, fatherland, holy land, fatherland, holy land. That all those people whose fatherland is here, whose holy land is here, are the rightful owners of this country. Those people whose holy land is in Arabia or Jerusalem, they are not the rightful owners, they are the foreigners. So, of course, the concept of citizenship is not based on religion in the rising classes in the Indian constitution. So, Hindutva, so Pitrabhumi, Punyabhumi, then he gives the three foundations of Hindutva. Please remember, Hinduism is a religion. Hindutva is a politics based on three central kernels, three foundations. What are these three foundations? Number one, Aryan race. Number two, Brahminical culture. Number three, the land spread from Sindhu to the sea. So around this, he built the concept of Hindutva. And fourth word, which is there, Hindu Rashtra, that we should not go by the Western notions of nationalism. They call this modern nationalism as Western. While it has nothing to do with the West in the, anywhere where the democracy develops, this notion of nationalism deepens and guides the destiny of the country. Anyway, so on one hand, we got independence, partition took place, long story, I will not go into that centrally, I will say, majority of Muslims opposed the partition plan. There was Allah Baksh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, uh, Moomin Conference, majority of Muslims, they opposed partition. Handful of elite Muslims who were part of Muslim League, they demanded it. And handfuls of elite Hindus, they articulated the concept of Hindu nation. While majority of Hindus, majority of Muslims, they all stood for Indian nationalism. So as we started becoming democratic, democracy doesn't come in a day. It's a long journey. Now, so in that way, the foundations of India were, were laid these autonomous institutions were, uh, came in. But from 1980s, after Shah Bano, Ram Temple issue started being brought up. Particularly, it became stronger with the implementation of Mandal Commission. Already in the beginning of 1980s, there were many riots against reservation for Dalits, many riots against promotion of OBCs and all that. And this culminated in the 
concentrated upper caste elite response in the form of rath yatra and it was a big blow to indian democracy uh, when these people responded to implement implementation of mandal commission in this particular form now so after that uh, i must say on one hand we have people ideology of bhagat singh and ambedkar who will talk of basic needs and dignity and equality of human beings on the other side there are issues which rss kept raising while india focused on five year plans developing iits scientific establishments research establishment irrigation facilities factories for production well well uh, india focused on that rss kept aloof kept criticizing all this and harping on the issue of great glorious ancient past now what is the ancient past where the rules of manusmriti were fully applicable and fully going on so anyway so they began with ram temple it yielded good dividends and they their electoral power went on increasing meanwhile rss silently very silently kept on indoctrinating young boys into the ideology of hindu rashtra ideology of hindu rashtra and through this they created swayam sevaks and pracharaks swayam sevaks and pracharaks and they were indoctrinated to say that we are a hindu nation from times immemorial muslims are foreigners christians foreigners that there are two central pillars of rss ideology one is to regard these people as foreigners second is to glorify the ancient hierarchy of caste and gender please remember rss doesn't just mean hindu nationalism doesn't doesn't just mean uh, attacking muslims and christian it also means glorifying trying to bring in the ancient caste and gender hierarchy in the new form initially they were very blunt about these hierarchies today they are very sophisticated and they talk in a language they use social engineering they have floated organizations like vanwasi kalyan ashram samajik samrastha manch and hundreds of organization which work in the different sections of society to promote the rss ideology their words are becoming very sophisticated expressions are being very sophisticated but the core agenda of hindu nationalism remains and this hindu nationalism is the threat to indian democracy let's see hinduism as practiced by gandhi is liberal open inclusive accepting diversity accepting diversity hindutva propagated by the whole what they call used to call sang parivar or rss combined that hindutva is exclusionary sectarian narrow and regarding others as outsiders so that politics is increasing because of various reasons uh, number one i will say uh, after 80s the workers movements got a big setback because of uh, the changes in the production process trade union movement which was a backbone of the progressive movements in the country it had its own setback also it suffered from some uh, flaws that uh, uh, the progressive people failed did not do that political education of these classes who were aspiring for better economic conditions but just by better economic conditions things don't work we also have to have better political system more stronger democratic system so today as uh, of course i will not go into the again cow beef all these issues they brought in love the has where they brought in so finally i will say that through these these issues they have succeeded in mobilizing number one large section of population to vote for them a large section of their workers have infiltrated into our police bureaucracy judiciary and different sections of administration 
the institutions which are supposed to defend our democracy they are their autonomy is lost and they are more or less captive to this ideology surrendering to this ideology bowing their heads to this ideology so divisiveness is breaking the backbone of indian democracy hatred is breaking our fraternity hatred is the foundation of violence hatred is a foundation of violence and violence leads to polarization of the communities polarization of the communities leads to the rise in the power of communal forces whatever you label them basically this sectarianism is out to be a big threat to indian democracy finally we can interpret the world the way we like according to our own limited understanding but main point is how do we change it how do we restore strengthen the democratic spirit in the country and that is one of the million rupee question because of course dollar is becoming very expensive so i am not using the word million dollar because even uh, that is unaffordable for us so million rupee question is how do we combat this growing divisiveness in our society number one i will say that uh, the walls of hatred have divided our society have broken our fraternity so we need to restore that basic uh, fraternity and that can be done by combating misconceptions against religious minorities to me this is very important because without removing this misconceptions about temple destructions forcible conversion large families muslims being terrorists this i will send a uh, some small document word file to you you and there are some books on amazon which you can have a look like there is a book called busting myths against minorities which we need to uh, these points we need to take to the society through our interactions and we need to set up community centers our struggle is very important i'll come to that but we also need community centers where we fashion our struggle against the damages to indian democracy where we also try to promote peace between different communities by joint celebrations and along with joint celebration by watching wonderful films which promote communal harmony watching excellent documentaries of people like anand patwardhan rakesh sharma watching videos watching videos uh, of various type like satya hindi as a brilliant series then ashok kumar pandey my own series my own youtube videos they try to promote a try to promote give a message of truth of indian history and indian reality so community center i think should be one of the major things we should focus around which we develop our struggles as well as give a message of peace amity harmony and combating the the vicious ideology being spread by the divisive communal forces second is the struggles of farmers unemployed youth and the uh, struggles of the people against rising prices against uh, snubbing the freedom of expression against our basic democratic rights those struggles need to be underlined and we need to associate with different organizations who have the common agenda of secularism democracy indian nationalism we may have different opinions fine but if we agree with the basic concept then we have to rub shoulder to shoulder in raising the pitch of our struggles for the positive agenda of diverse secularism indian constitution this should be the central part recently we saw the excellent uh, movement in the form of farmer struggle shahin bagh struggle we need not stop at that they have given brilliant beginning but those and the other our own struggles i am very proud of the way indian struggles for wages working hours 
improvement of the working conditions they have been remarkable and they have been remarkable achievement for the poor people of the society now in current times where democracy is under threat the poverty levels are worsening price rise is going to the sky while few corporate sections they start becoming stronger and stronger so friends this is a time that we step in and our, our struggles we need to march separately but strike together we may have minor differences but the broader unity of democracy secularism needs to be kept in front of us and we should shed our uh, some differences uh, we 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 should keep our differences but we should uh, ally with people who believe in these basic concepts of indian constitution and uh, uh, plural liberal values we should try to do that so that our movements become stronger they don't remain fragmented and isolated and in this context i do see that uh, after all whatever is happening in the negative way ca comes in sometimes then uh, people uh, our uh, uh, brilliant writers and activists they are arrested uh, umar khalid is in jail so all these things which have happened they can be opposed only by joint struggles on one side and on the other side we need to promote the dissemination of values of indianness democracy our rights they have named kartavya path the duty mark they have named but we have rights also for the present rulers there are there is a, a kartavya path duties for majority of people and rights belong to a handful of elite handful of corporate and handful of rulers this need division of rights and duties they want to impose on the society we have to oppose it by trying to uh, unite uh, for our rights also and the way economy is falling in the indices of development freedom of expression freedom of religion uh, democratic uh, democratic strength all these are constantly declining so it's a Uh, alarm bell for social activists like us that we have to wake up we have to give a fresh thought to the type of activities we have doing been doing so that we can broaden our broaden our network of movement on one side and install community centers on the other promote community centers on the other where we talk of struggles where we talk of positive values i hope uh, i could make some point and i am sure i will also send you some material uh, on this which you can share and uh, i hope that we succeed in preserving indian democracy over a period of time thank you very much uh, thank you dr ram kimi energy uh, for your uh, excellent speech on the subject and uh, your concern about uh, the of the Indian democracy and uh, your explanation of a brief uh, with a brief historical context of uh, how Indian as our uh, 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 national country the secular uh, nation uh, is evolved in India and its uh, genesis its uh, development at the same time the how uh, uh, RSS uh, Hindutva forces are uh, developed their own agenda and now And, and the uh, last step of the concreting their Hindustan concept. And you also um, put forward the the the, the, the some uh, the important uh, uh, suggestion or your idea of one side one at uh, one side making an awareness or consciousness of the secular uh, concept among the people. Uh, and at the same time, the oppressed masses, the various struggles of movements of the oppressed masses in the country. So, uh, some uh, questions have already uh, come. So, one important question that is about uh, the practical uh, situation and uh, how we are really going to do. Uh, uh, what the questioner uh, uh, says. 
send uh, the Hindu forces are on hold and uh, already conquered almost all the administrative and uh, uh, ideological and all the uh, important institutions already and they are on the last step of uh, materializing the, in the Indian uh, Hindu uh, Hindu Rastra uh, very strong uh, at the same time uh, how we, you are expecting or uh, how you uh, uh, hope to overcome before that with this uh, very minimal uh, uh, togetherness even we have uh, some uh, uh, present farmers movement uh, uh, historical farmers movement and before that uh, uh, why nationwide huge anti CIA movement of the people by youth, by uh, women, and uh, the, um, uh, all the work of life. Uh, so, that was two very uh, uh, important uh, historical model. However, uh, our uh, reality is the, the, uh, the opposition parties were not with even better uh, uh, the uh, this, uh, ruling class second whatever uh, reactionary aspect with them uh, but they are not with the uh, fast front uh, they are totally uh, is ununited and uh, there is no particular concrete reality for uh, the togetherness of the masses of the people or for the develop for the resistance for the protection of the uh, democratic uh, uh, India so how you how you uh, view or this uh, Congress situation before the 20, uh, 2024? How what will be the uh, situation? Yeah, it's a actually very difficult question to answer, and I think uh, as the political uh, political power is rested in the hands of uh, is resting in the hands of BJP the flourishing of communal politics becomes strong. The strength of RSS and uh, such forces becomes strong. So at electoral level, you correctly said that there is a uh, divided opposition. So I think uh, we should also raise a social, uh, we should also raise a voice that opposition parties have to come together. And through our electoral, uh, electoral mechanisms, we should try to see that a candidate who has a potential for defeating BJP, we should try to work for that. And uh, once uh, BJP is not in minority, or not in majority, I mean, not in majority, that time probably they can decide uh, how the government will be. But first task is that we have to get away, uh, get rid of BJP because till it will be in power, it will be infiltrating, it will be infiltrating democratic institutions, weakening them, it will be infiltrating the universities, the colleges with that type of a thinking, and that thinking in turn will further weaken the Indian democracy. So I think apart from other things, at electoral level also, whatever little we can do, we can try to ensure, uh, number one, opposition unity. So all of us, we cannot do it, but in case possible, we should try to promote ideologically, and if some delegations can be taken to some parties, and if that doesn't work, during elections we promote that whosoever candidate can defeat the BJP candidate should be voted for so that BJP is reduced to a minority, and then uh, whatever government forms. Second point is that we can't let our pressure go. Our pressure has to continue, whichever be the government. Our pressure for democratic rights, democratic institutions, autonomy, and the rights of intellectuals and others to express their opinion. This pressure has to continue irrespective of who is the ruling government. So the task for those who are committed to a society with equality, society with pluralism, our tasks are infinite and they have to continue, continue, irrespective of the election results. Even if BJP gets defeated in 2024, our tasks remain because they have already infiltrated in a very big way. So <laughs> struggling against that will remain a major part of our struggle in times to come. Uh, 
thank you thank you for your answer and uh, the, in this continuous uh, same uh, orientation for, for example the last uh, up election up and uttarakhand uh, election and before that uh, west bengal election and other five state uh, election uh, including yourself like uh, shamsul islam and uh, dr shamsul islam and anand patwardhan many of the secular intellectual progressive intellectual is called unitedly called for the uh, defeating bjp in the election and also the farmers movement also uh, forward the same orientation without uh, particularly supporting any other uh, party and uh, in, even our party the tamil rest are also uh, continuously called for the same slogan uh, defeat uh, fascist uh, front that is the bjp Uh, in our party congress also the central theme of our political uh, resolution also focusing on the same still uh, uh, the reality of because major uh, uh, opposition parties are not in in uh, the concrete understanding on this called so you said it is uh, continuously we have to continue our pressure it is a social pressure political pressure to all the opposition party what do you okay uh, the role of left in the one side or uh, the electoral left and the uh, revolutionary left also in the same time what is the role uh, current role of the congress like party who are uh, supposed to come forward but not in the concrete uh, still not in the uh, concrete uh, plan for it uh, there is any other way of uh, uh, the people's massive people's uh, like the uh, anti ca uh, or commerce movement to counter this uh, challenge this uh, this the threat there is any possibility see i think uh, revolutionary left and the left in general probably is the most secular component of our struggle so as i pointed out left has more to focus uh, through electoral and non electoral uh intervention to see that the secular values become strong so one of the things which i propose is that we should begin community centers community addas where we propagate our ideology we propagate the values of peace through cultural mechanisms through uh, intellectual dialogues or through uh, dialogues with the community and through videos and films this also i think left must take up and left is the most capable organization to take up this type of a community work we don't just have to restrict ourselves to what they call seva charity our 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 issue has to be to take up their issues try to take them to their culmination and also at the same time making them aware of the real issues which are going against the interest of the people so at the moment i think this is a moment when revolutionary left and left in general has a very big responsibility of holding the movements together and in the community level to bring up a movement of uh, amity and peace and at electoral level to ensure that uh, bjp is defeated in 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 comprehensively in the coming elections and since <laughs> left doesn't have any selfish motives it is committed to values it is committed to uh, a particular type of a politics i think it can it should play that role in the coming times okay thank you uh, dr nanti uh, for your uh, valuable time for uh, uh, for the lecturing and after the, uh, the answering the some important question so um, hope let us go uh, we shall continue our struggle Uh, at uniting the all secular uh, forces and democratic forces to recapture the democratic and the secular soul of the country and uh, to overcome the the god this, this uh, very dangerous uh, threat of the uh, against the secular uh, concept itself and the democratic concept itself so we will continue our struggle uh, we shall overcome sure Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hello, dear comrades and, yes. and friends. Uh, today is our 14th uh, of the uh, lecture series, which started from 19th August and will culminate on 21st September. We are to uh, the 12th Party Congress of CPI Melrose Club. 